Hi, John here. In this video, we're going to take a look at a water heater. Specifically, we're going to have a look at an electric water heater. We'll look at why we have water heaters, all of an electric water heater's main components, how it works, and also some of the problems that you're likely to encounter with your own water heater. So if you're troubleshooting a problem that you're having with your water heater, then this video will be quite useful. Here is our water heater. I'll do a little spin so you can have a proper look at it. This particular water heater will typically be installed down in the cellar or the basement and we'll use it for heating up the water for use in our kitchen sink or our bathroom shower or for any other purpose where we need to use hot water. But what is a water heater? Well, let's have a quick look at some of the main parts and then we'll go through them in more detail. We've got a connection on the right here. That is our cold water inlet. We've got another connection on the left and that is our hot water discharge. So cold water coming in on the right, that's our cold water inlet, and hot water discharged on the left, that's our hot water outlet or our hot water discharge. We've got an air bleed on the top of the heater tank. That's not typical, but on this particular model, it's been built in there. That allows us to bleed off any air that might be inside the tank. That's particularly useful if you're filling up the tank and you want to ensure all the air is purged. As I say though, it's quite unusual because you can actually just loosen off the connections on the right and the left, or even on the anode, which is underneath this section here, and you can bleed off the air that way. You will usually have, or should have, two of these valves. Here is one, there should be another one over here. Ball valves are typically used for this type of application because when you turn them 90 degrees, they can move from fully open to fully closed or vice versa. They're what they call quarter turn valves and they're also fast acting. We've got the tank, which is signified here by this thin yellow line. And above the tank, we've got some yellow insulation and that insulates the hot water inside the tank and it means we don't lose our heat to the ambient environment surrounding the tank, which would make our water heater quite inefficient. Inside the water heater itself, we've got this long rod here. That is an anode. It's a sacrificial anode, typically manufactured from magnesium or some sort of zinc alloy. And that'll wear away over time and what it's actually doing is protecting the inside of the water heater as well as other metal parts by corroding away instead of the metal parts corroding. So it's called a sacrificial anode because it's sacrificed to save the other metals, the more important ones, the more expensive ones from corroding away. It's preventing what they call galvanic corrosion from occurring on some of your more vital water heater surfaces. Aside from the sacrificial anode, we've got this tube coming down from the cold water inlet. That's a dip tube. And the cold water is going to travel through the dip tube and it actually comes out right at the base of the tank. I'll try and angle this correctly, although it's quite cramped in here. There you go, you can see we've got an opening. That's where our cold water is going to come out. Sometimes there'll be little slits here and these little slits allow the water to come out of the pipe rather than all at the bottom, just gradually as it reaches, say, the lower 20% of the dip tube. Aside from the dip tube, the other important elements that we have within the water heater, in fact, what I'll do, let me just zoom out for a moment. We can have a look from up the top. You can see we've got a heating element that's coming in to our water tank. And this heating element actually has a resistor inside this tube here. That's what makes the heating element. The resistor is connected to an electrical supply. You can see the electrical supply here. We connect our electrical supply to these connections and electrical current then flows through our resistor. And as it flows through the resistor, we generate heat. So we've got one resistor here, or one heating element, and then we've got another one down the bottom 
of our water tank, you can see it here, and they'll be cycled off and on by thermostats. You can actually see a thermostat through the plastic cover, that would be this item. And we can use the thermostat for setting the desired water temperature within the water tank. And that might be around 50 degrees Celsius, which is about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't want to set the temperature too high because when people have a shower or perhaps go to wash their hands, they might end up burning themselves or scalding themselves on the water. There's another thermostat further down. That would be this one here. And both of those will control the temperature of the water within the water heater. It's important to realize that the water temperature varies within the heater. At the top, the water is going to be hotter than at the bottom, unless the water has been sitting in the tank for a prolonged period of time, in which case the temperature will actually equalize from bottom to top. This item over here, this is our temperature pressure relief valve. And this will open if we have a over temperature or excessively high temperature within our water heater, or if we have a high pressure or an overpressurization scenario within our water heater. What actually happens is we have a high pressure or a high temperature, and the valve opens and drains the water down until it's discharged from the base of this drain pipe. It's important to have a drain pipe because you don't want hot water being discharged directly under the valve because if anyone's working in the area nearby, they also might get scalded. So you have the drain pipe so that people can see that an overpressurization is occurring or an over temperature scenario and people can come and inspect what's happening and why. On the bottom here, we've got our drain valve. This one has a hand wheel on top, although the best option, once again, is to have a ball valve because they open and close quite quickly and we can drain the water out of the base of the tank. The reasons for having a drain valve is that it allows us to drain the water out, particularly when we want to perform maintenance on our water heater, but also when we want to drain out bits of sediment bits of calc, etc. from the bottom of the tank. So what are the problems that you're likely to encounter with your water heater? Well, one of the most common problems is that your dip tube breaks off from the top of the tank. It'll snap off about here and then fall to the base of the tank. We don't want this because that means the cold water is then discharged to the top of the tank. And if it's coming in and hanging around this section here at the top of the tank, then it's also going to be taken directly out of the top discharge here. Remember, this is our hot water outlet. So we're not going to get hot water at our tap, at our faucet, or in our shower, etc. So the dip tube has to be there in order that the cold water goes to the base of the tank. To get around this problem, it is also possible to have your cold water inlet at the base of the water heater, it just depends upon the design you have. One reason to inspect the water heater is because the sacrificial anode will wear away over time, it will corrode away, and you're going to need to replace it. You can do that quite easily by isolating the water heater hydraulically. That means closing the ball valves, for example, on the right and the left, so that the cold and hot water inlets are closed. Turn off the heating elements, relieve the system pressure via the drain, and then you can undo this item here. You can unscrew it, and then you'll be able to retract the anode. It'll just pull straight out the top of the water heater. Once you've got the anode out, you can replace it. Normally there'll be a steel rod inside or underneath this layer of magnesium or zinc alloy. If you can see the steel rod in the middle, you might have a slight problem because it means the anode has worn away to such a degree that you may not be protecting some of the other metals inside your water heater. If you replace the anode periodically though, you should be able to stop corrosion of your water heater metal surfaces, particularly your tank and any fittings that you may have attached to the water heater. When we're talking about the tank, 
and the thin piece of stainless steel that forms the water heater tank, it's important to realize that it's actually protected by a coating or an enamel layer, usually glass-based. We coat the inside surfaces of the water heater with this glass-based coating or enamel in order to protect the stainless steel underneath. We talked briefly about calc. Our calc is calcium and other minerals that are separated out from the water and solidified on the inside surfaces of your water heater. The problem areas typically are on top of your heater elements. You'll end up with a white, sometimes quite thick layer of calc on your heater elements. That's very problematic because this calc or mineral deposit is a great thermal insulator. When your heating element is getting quite hot and you're trying to heat up the water inside your water tank, you end up with hot spots on the heating element and they'll tend to rupture as they get overheated in certain places. Remember that usually around this heating element there'll be water and the water gets hot and as it gets hot its density decreases and it moves up to the top of the tank. That is natural convection. We've got a less dense heaty water rising to the top of the tank whilst our colder water will accumulate more at the bottom of the tank. It's another reason for having the dip tube. It's because the water will be heated up from the bottom and it will naturally rise upwards. If we were putting cold water into the top of the tank, it would be moving down as the hot water was trying to move up and get out of the tank. And that's quite an inefficient way to design our water heater. So if we have this calc, also known as scale, building up on our heater elements, then we're going to end up with potentially ruptured heater elements. In addition to that, we're going to end up with quite large electricity bills because we're providing the electricity to our resistor element, but it's not heating up the water because this layer of thermal insulation has built up on the heating element. Another problem with mineral deposits is that they'll also accumulate on items like the temperature pressure valve. If that happens, the valve will potentially stick because the mechanism is coated in mineral deposits. If it sticks, it won't actuate at the correct temperature or the correct pressure. And if that occurs, we're going to end up with very hot water within our tank and the water will not drain out through our temperature pressure relief valve. The same situation occurs when we have an overpressurization of the water tank, the valve will not open and that pressure is going to be relieved somewhere else, potentially rupturing our tank or damaging one of the fittings or another connection within the water system. Periodically, we can open up the drain valve to drain out any mineral deposits, any bits of scale, any bits of rust that might have accumulated in the bottom of the tank. And when we open up the drain, we might also get bits of the sacrificial anode being drained as well. When the anode is quite corroded, little bits of it break off, and these bits will gather at the base of the tank, and we can drain them out using the drain valve. So that was a short introduction to a electric water heater. I hope you found it informative and useful. If you want to learn more about engineering or engineering related topics, then check out savory.com because we've got over 40 hours of engineering video tutorials and courses online, and we release more and more content every month. Thank you very much for your time.